What's up, guys? Welcome back to another Daily Bible Reading Snapshot. Today we're looking at Proverbs 28 and 29, and then we're looking at 2 Corinthians 7 in the New Testament. Today, one of the things we see at the beginning here, in Proverbs 28, verse 1, it says, The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. You see right there the difference between a person who's walking in integrity and a person who's not. The wicked, it says, they flee um, when no one pursues. They're anxious, they're nervous, they're guilty, they're afraid because there's all these uncertainties. But the righteous who walk in integrity, they trust God. They don't have to be anxious. They don't have to be afraid. And they're bold because they know they're living in the fear of the Lord and that God will take care of them. That all comes from trusting God and obeying God. Now, a lot of Christians have a lot of anxiety and really act more like the wicked who flee when no one pursues than the righteous who are as bold as a lion. We need to fight that anxiety by trusting God and obeying God. If we're trusting God and obeying God, we have nothing to be anxious about. Sure, there's plenty of things to be concerned about as we look at the world and say, wow, there's a lot of things that are bad out there. There's a lot of things that could happen to me. But ultimately, that's not an excuse for us to lack trust in God and be anxious and to be worried. The wicked do that. They're anxious, they're worried when no one chases after them. That's how a lot of people live today. But the righteous, we ought to be as bold as the lion. Now, it says evil men don't understand justice in verse 5. It says the wicked people, they don't even get that. Uh, so as we look at this, we say we want we want to have integrity. It says in verse 6, better is a poor man who walks in integrity than a rich person who is crooked in his ways. So it's an important connection we need to make to see, okay, if we're going to be righteous and we're going to be a person of integrity, that's going to change the way we live and change the way we act. Well, how do we become righteous people? Well, a lot of it starts with confessing our sin. We see that here in verse 13. It says, whoever conceals or hides his transgression will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Blessed is the one who fears the Lord, but whoever hardens his heart will fall into calamity. That is so important as you approach reading the Bible. That's so important as you approach listening to sermons, as you approach just being confronted by God's word in general. If you're a person who wants to hide and conceal and throw away your transgressions and say, well, I'm just going to act like those didn't happen and I'm going to hide those away and lie about them. Well, that's not helpful. But if you obtain, if you confess them, you're going to obtain mercy. If you're going to fear God, that's going to keep you from hardening your heart. You can't do both at the same time. You can't run in the direction of hardening your heart and of doing what's wrong and hiding your sin. You can't do all that and at the same time be fearing God and pursuing God. A lot of people can act like they're doing that, that one when they're really doing the other. But in truth, you can't do both at the same time. So helpful for us to say, I want to be a person who's seeking the truth. I want to be a person who's confessing sin. Verse 18 says, whoever walks in integrity will be delivered. But he who is crooked will suddenly fall. Um, again, it's like the same theme brought up over and over again here. Now, verse 18 to verse 25, and really to the end of the chapter, describe the difference between the greedy, wicked person and the righteous person with integrity. So as you read that, look out for the differences in the way they talk and their lifestyle. Uh, chapter 29 has a lot to say about how we live and how we talk and how we act. Verse 5 says, if you flatter your neighbor, which flattery, I haven't talked about that much, but Proverbs talks about it. The idea of saying something nice to somebody that's not true. Saying something nice that you don't mean, that's flattery. If you flatter your neighbor, it says that you spread a net for his feet. It's like you're trying to trap him. Um, it's not a loving thing to do to be nice and say nice things that you don't mean, that are lies. That's wrong. It's not, you can't just say, oh, well, I'm just trying to be nice. No, stop saying things that are false and not true that are nice. That's called flattery. It says you actually hate the person if you're doing that. It's not helpful for them. So that's verse five. Verse nine says, um, if you enter an argument with a foolish person, don't expect it to go over well. It says, if a wise man has an argument with a fool, the fool only rages and laughs and there is no quiet. Which leads into verse 11. It says, a fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds back. There's something that people do today um, and they use the label that this verse actually says, and it's wrong. It's the idea of venting. Uh, people say, well, I'm just venting, so it's okay. I'm just, I'm just venting. No, venting is wrong. And this says that you're a fool if you give full vent to your spirit. And it says a wise man quietly holds it back. He doesn't say everything he's thinking. A wise person leaves some things in his heart that he doesn't say out loud. A fool empties out his whole heart and just says, blah, 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 blah. this is all I'm thinking. I, uh, you know, that person, oh, they're terrible, aren't they? And this is horrible, and I don't like this, and oh, that person's horrible. Like, all those horrible things, right? 
That is what the fool does. You're not supposed to do that. If you're wanting to follow God, don't be a person who's giving full vent to your spirit. Now, the chapter goes on and says a lot more. Verse 15 and verse 17, again, talk about wisdom and talk about reproving children and, and discipline. It says, the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Again, opposite of how the world thinks. The world thinks if you leave a child to themselves, they'll in order they'll eventually do good because children are just corrupted by environment. That is unbiblical. Children are bad when they start and they need to be corrected. Verse 17 says, "Discipline your son and he will give you rest and he will give delight to your heart." If you discipline your kids, it says in the end, that's going to help people. Um, verse 19 talks about discipline again. It says, by mere words, a servant is not disciplined. For though he understands, he will not respond. I think that's super interesting. Again, this is not talking about parent and child, but I think the idea applies. Now, this is really talking about um, a servant. If you tell your servant, hey, you really shouldn't do that anymore. Uh, it's wrong. Uh, just stop doing that. What this says is, yeah, they might understand, but they're not going to respond. That's another principle about discipline. Discipline needs to be more than just saying, hey, you know what? I really think you shouldn't do that. Um, it needs to be stronger than that because it says you want them to listen. Then verse 20, another interesting one that relates back up to verse 11. It says, do you see a man who is hasty in his words? There's more hope for a fool than there is for him. If you're a person who's hasty, you always want to talk. You always want to say things. It says there's more hope for a fool than for that person who always says what they're thinking, who always just responds um, based on what they're feeling like. There's even more here. It says in verse 22, a man of wrath stirs up strife and one who's given to anger causes much transgression. Even since like anger and pride is mentioned a lot here. Those two sins, right? If you have those sins, they cause other sins. Just like a lot of the sexual sins described at the beginning of the book, you do those sins, it causes other sins. It leads to lying. It leads to cheating and stealing and all those things. So again, another one, <laughs> so much here. Verse 23, um, one's pride brings him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. Saying, if you're proud, you are not going to do well. But if you are lowly in spirit, if you're humble, you will obtain honor. But if you hate your life, one thing that you can do, verse 24, if you hate your life, well, then partner up with a thief. It says, a partner of a thief hates his own life. He hears the curse, but discloses nothing. He hears what's going on, but doesn't disclose anything the, the, of, of the thief. So, so much for you to take away. I'd love for you to memorize some verses from this section because it is really, really key to you understanding how to live for God in this world. Everything you just read in Proverbs 28 and 29 is helpful. Now, 2 Corinthians 7 talks about repentance, and that's the main idea, that's the main thrust of this chapter. Paul says, when I came, I grieved you. I made you sad. Here's the thing. I didn't want to make you sad just because I wanted you to be sad, but when I wrote things that were hard for you, and even when I visited and things were hard in my visit, he says, I want you to be grieved into repentance. He says there's two types of grief in this world that Christians can experience. Um, even non-Christians can experience one kind. It says people experience two types of grief. There's a worldly grief that leads to nothing, that people just feel bad um, that they got caught or feel bad that they were in the wrong, but they don't change anything. Then there's a godly grief. There's a grief that takes God's word, hears the correction, feels bad on the inside, but more than they just kind of feel bad, they are really motivated to act differently. They're motivated to be different and to repent. It says godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Now, what earnestness and God, godly grief has produced in you? He says, I've seen your life. I've seen that you've been earnest in your repentance. Look what it's produced in you. It's produced earnestness, zeal, indignation, longing, fear, punishment. At every point, you've proved yourselves innocent in the matter. That's what real repentance looks like. It looks like people not only hearing correction, not only saying, I want to respond to it, but actually showing by the fruit of their life that they have responded to the call of repentance. That's what we need to see in our life. We need to see real repentance. It starts with a godly grief and it leads to a changed life. That's what repentance looks like. So whenever people use that word, just know it has to include the change of life, the radical change of life that starts with a change of heart. So thanks for reading. We'll see you back tomorrow for another daily Bible reading snapshot. Thank you.